Sometimes it feels like the sun will never rise, like the birds will never sing again. Believe in a power greater than what you are going through when you don't know what to do. That's right. When you don't know what to do, just keep on breathing. From the City of Angels in Los Angeles, welcome to all my listeners out there in Radio Land. I'm Dave, the Caregiver's Caregiver at caregiverdave.com, and we're coming to you live on 24-7 numerous syndicated radio podcast networks and 26 global audio and video platforms, platforms like iHeartRadio, iTunes, YouTube, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Vimeo, and a whole bunch more. In fact, we're proud to be voted Number one caregiver podcast of the top 50 on Player FM and number two on Feedspot and number two on CaringVillage.com. And we have an especially exciting show planned for you today. If you are caregivers worried about higher education, Justin Ducombe is the author of College Bound Strategies and has been consulting on college planning since 2011 and in the financial industry since 2012. His consulting work focuses on helping families tackle challenges they thought were unimaginable. And we're talking to burned out caregivers. And so I would question that there are many caregivers, not that I would question, but that I would assume that there are many caregivers that are struggling with their education and many times their caregiving responsibilities uh, interfere. And so Justin's going to help us figure that out. So just a reminder that uh, you can watch or listen to this interview and all our interviews on our membership website, caregiverdave.com, or any of the other 26 global networks I mentioned before. But before we get started, I want to thank last week's guest, Dr. VK Raju, who was born in India, and he is the founding patron member of AAPI. He's a clinical professor of ophthalmology at West Virginia University. So that interview, of course, is also available on our website. All right, enough of that. Let's get going with uh, Justin. Justin, welcome to The Caregiver Show. We're so excited to have you on. Thank you, Dave. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me on. Likewise. And I always like to ask my guests, just who is Justin Duncombe and why was he placed on this earth? That's an interesting question because in my lifetime, that's probably been an answer that's changed a few times. Um, I would say uh, who I am is I'm the son of a couple of great parents who uh, worked their butts off to give me lots of opportunities to get a good education, try a lot and build a lot of experiences. And uh, Mm -hmm. the other thing about me is I always seem to be in positions of trying to help people through things. And um, when I was graduating college, uh, my father, who's also a financial consultant, Uh, was helping a longtime family friend who had been diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. And when this got, when this happened, he came to my dad and said, I only have one question. Uh, Will my wife be okay? And my dad slowly walked him through all the processes of how he'd set up the finances and how she would have enough income to live out her life. And it turns out they had planned for uh, long-term care caregiving in the event of uh, situations like this. So they actually had a caregiver who was with him and took care of him for the next nine months and was actually the one with him at 3 a.m. when he passed. And uh, when he did pass, the work that my dad did uh, allowed her to live on an income that was even higher than he earned working. And she was a stay-at-home mom. So seeing how that worked from my dad's point of view um, with a longtime family friend really convinced me to get into this industry. And once we got into this industry, we, it had turned out that there were uh, a lot of schools that needed a lot of help helping families understand how education costs worked. And it just so happened that at the time they were also working with this guy who worked with the Department of Education uh, to help families understand how to afford higher education. And it's it's something that just ended up getting stuck in my mind and something that I I kept getting, I kept being in the right place at the right time to help people with this. And I just ended up joining the practice. And, you know, 11 years later, here I am, I'm, um, I'm the main partner. And a few years ago, we were doing these presentations over and over for high schools. Mm. And 
a lot of these schools said, well, we don't really think this is right for our demographic when they had disadvantaged families. So I wrote the book, College Math Strategies, to give everyone access to this information. So uh, I always seem to be someone who's trying to see a way to solve problems to help people get information they need. Sure. Now, I understand you've uh, financially consulted many families providing care for developmentally handicapped children. Mm -hmm. Family members are suffering serious illnesses, families with a uh, family member in the hospice, et cetera. So uh, caregiving is not uh, unfamiliar to you. Not at all. Um, our, like I said, our audience are burned out caregivers, and many caregivers did not volunteer for the job that they're doing. <laughs> they, no, they didn't. They, they were drafted or, or you know, everybody uh, out of all the siblings, you know, they were the lucky one that was selected either by the loved one or, or they were the one that were, was the geographically closer and many oh, yeah. of them had to give up their education plans or put them on hold, et cetera. So, I mean, sometimes uh, they don't know what to do. Uh, what, what do you recommend for someone who's in that situation? So if we're dealing with, say, a young adult who is in the situation where they are trying to get a higher education, uh, depending on the age they are, they may or may not be considered mm -hmm. under the parent's situation or they may be under their own. That really depends on a few of their of need based questions of whether you're whether that student that individual is married themselves they have kids themselves they were in the military things like that if they are under their parents they're going to go off their parents income and so depending Until on what age is about twenty six or no so for college it's twenty four for twenty six that's the one for uh, medical exemption when you can still be under parents at medicals so. If you are 24 and under, and you, these other characteristics that I just mentioned, if you can say yes to any of those, it's under your own. If you say no to all of those, it's under your parents. Mm. So if you're someone who's trying to help pay for, if you're trying to pay for school under these situations, it comes down to what your income is. Now, if you let's go with the extreme example, because everyone says, oh, look at the, the high cost of college. And they look at, you know, the Harvard's, the Browns, the Johns Hopkins, those kinds mm -hmm. of schools. And those schools are between seventy and eighty-one thousand dollars these days. If you have a family who is making roughly under eighty thousand, you're going to pay about five thousand bucks a year. Not that giant seventy to eighty thousand dollar price tag. I work with some families that you know this is actually a real family. The the mom is the primary caregiver for a, a student born with. Um, a, it's something like autism of that nature. It might even be autism, but it requires a lot of care. So all the assistance that they get for care that they get from the government, that doesn't count towards their financial aid because they're actually paying for these expenses. It actually lowers their income and they get additional assistance. So they would qualify at a school like that to pay like 18 grand. So you're paying half the price at some of these higher level institutions, quote unquote, higher level institutions than you would at state institutions. Uh, even at state level schools, uh, community colleges, even vocational technical schools, there are a lot of programs that if you have this sort of situation going on in your family or for yourself, that you get access to these additional funds that are available to these different, these different groups. Mm. Some are the ones that I mentioned first, those high le higher level institutions. Those are primarily uh, need-based based on your financial situation. Others are going to be state and government program-based, and some are actually merit-based. So depending on the school you go to, it's going to change a bit, but there is a substantial amount of money out there, especially for families that have hard income times. If you're paying for all these medical expenses, well, that actually lowers the income regardless of what it is and makes it potentially a lot more affordable for a student. You know, I mean, now you may be struggling with, you know, depending on your level of care, if you're the one providing it, you may have a hard time, you know, balancing the time. But those are also things that go into when you do eventually get to that higher education, because mm -hmm. this system carries on well past the age of 24. So especially in the day of, uh, of COVID, where a lot of education is happening at home uh, via computer, that could uh, help someone balance that load, no? Oh, yeah. And it, it doesn't matter whether you were on campus or not, because a lot of schools, interestingly enough, were saying, hey, um, you're still going to pay the full price, but you're not going to live on campus. <laughs> so <laughs> that was a bit of a, a crazy situation that year. But yeah, that those those types of situations, if you are doing online learning at some of those institutions, it still counts towards lowering that tuition cost. So it sounds like you're saying that they could actually be in a better position because now it's going to cost less 
than what they were going to pay if they weren't even a caregiver or helping out a caregiver. Correct. In many situations, yes. And like I said, that does depend on school by school. But yeah, there are a lot of opportunities for these aid programs at many different types of schools that will make it less expensive. So education is getting higher and higher and higher. Um, Any chance that that uh, is going to stop and maybe it'll stable? uh, You know, it's all about supply and demand, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are trying to see, well, maybe college isn't what I'm supposed to. Maybe I should look into a trade or something like that. How how should they go about determining, uh, you know, should I spend three hundred thousand dollars and and then realize I'm out of work and now I got to pay it off for the next 20 years? I mean, lots of things to think about. No, that is very, very true. And that comes back to a very mature decision on the part of a lot of students on the part of parents, um, even it adults, requires, it requires a very big reality check with students of, you know, I'm dealing with a couple of families right now of a couple of different ilks. Some want to go into the STEM fields. And if you're going into STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, math, anything that has a hard practical skill, college is a very strong candidate for those types of students. Uh, where it's not a strong candidate, if you're going into a lot of the arts programs these days, a lot of the humanities programs these days, And I say that with a lot of sadness because those programs used to be designed about helping you understand thought and communication at higher levels. But these days they're seen from the edge, from the employer community, they're seen more as liabilities because too many of these students are coming out with ideas about how business, about how life, about how commerce run that don't necessarily match up with how things really work. And so they essentially have to be retrained when they've already supposedly paid for this very expensive education to train them. So that's kind of a problem and a disconnect that needs to be sorted out between employers and education. And a lot of that's already being done because if you have a student who, like you said, is going to pay two, 300 grand and they're going to pay for an education that won't get them a job. Well, eventually students should stop selecting those educations. (laughs) So, and that's the point there is if you're looking at those educations and you look at, okay, There are a variety of research programs within the Department of Labor and the Department of Education that take a look at, based on education majors, what are people graduating with that get them jobs? Humanities are not getting jobs unless you count Starbucks. Uh, Arts jobs are not not getting jobs unless you count Starbucks. So if you're talking about those educations, you may like those things. You may like philosophy and psychology and you know, dance programs. I have one family right now, they want to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to go to a dance program. Now, granted, if you are a very successful elite dancer, you can make a ton of money, but it is a very, very low, very, very low outcome opportunity. I mean, every athlete has to deal with this. If you want to go to a college to play a sport, you have to deal with it in in the likelihood, even if you're good, you may never play professional sports. So you still need to have a fallback. And that's the point that a lot of students are not making very maturely right now that they were in 2008 when they realized that what the what the financial crisis was doing is you have to realize what your education is going to do to get you a job and will college get you that job or that opportunity for a career and you may want to do dance or philosophy or the humanities do that as a minor but do have something that will be a hard major that you can at least rely on to get you employment and to your point is college the right option well if you look at a lot of robotics and engineering programs these days it's not the only option anymore. Mm. If you look at a lot of your top technology companies, your Facebook, your Googles, your Apples, a lot of them now have training programs for programmers and uh, program developers because when you go to a college program, you're there for four years. And if you're doing any studying in your first two years, a lot of what you study is obsolete by the time you graduate because everything's changing at about a two-year pace. So if that's the case, they're saying, well, Don't go to college, get your certification and just come straight to work. So your all your skills are up to date and tuned in because you're going to be over the hill and out by the time you're 35, 40. So you might as well come early. And and do they pay for those training programs? Do you have to be an employee of theirs or how does that work? So it really depends on the employer, your skill. um, It really depends because you could have a very gifted student who's coming out of high school, they've done some advanced programs, they've done some job placement programs, they've done some skill training programs that these different companies look at. And within technology and engineering, there's a lot of those kinds of competitions that are out there. So 
you may find that those kinds of students will be, hey, we'll pay for your training and come straight to work for us. For so others being recruited, just like a, a sports figure, yes? Oh, yeah. You can easily be recruited. <laughs> but on the other side of that, you know, paying for a training program that takes one or two years doesn't cost all that much. And you actually still can get financial aid to do coding to yeah. go and get that job. For instance, uh, I happen to know a family member who works at Microsoft. And one of their coworkers did this on the job training. He used to be a truck driver. And then he went and did his own coding classes. He learned to, learned to code while he was on the road. And now he's one of the top programmers for Microsoft. And he's even wow. wrote, written several books on programming for the company. So regardless of that situation, you can still get those kind of degrees and still work for a high-end company if, if, you know what you're, if you know the pathway that you can take. Did you say he was a truck driver? He used to be a truck driver. He used to be a truck driver. Wow. Well, what kind of mistakes do families make that can cost them a lot of money? Ooh, well, there are, there are two big mistakes that families make. The first one is kind of a big one. It seems kind of obvious. They don't fill out the financial aid application. <laughs> that sounds like a weird and obvious one, but let me explain that one a little more. Well, should you they know, let somebody fill it out for them? In most cases, that's illegal. <laughs> <laughs> so, really? Uh, yeah, there, there was a big problem back in the day of people basically paying people to do financial aid applications. And you're at the end of that application, you're having someone sign a document for you. And that's like, that's forgery basically. Now there are certain conditions you can have where you can have a preparer do the work and that person also goes on there, but the parent and the student still have to be involved to a fair degree to actually do the application, even with the preparer. So the reason most people don't do it because the application itself is pretty simple. I'm of the mindset that most people can still do it on their own because the application has gotten pretty good these days after 10 years of development online, that it can now walk people through most of the steps without too many mistakes. Mm. But And I'll get to the mistakes that happen in a second. But people don't do it because they think, oh, I make $110,000. I'm never going to get any financial aid. Wheeler did the numbers on someone two years ago that made that number. They were looking at paying six to $8,000 at a private school. They were looking at paying the same to go to private school as community college. So what people think is an income that won't get them financial aid is usually drastically lower than what they think they would get. I once knew a CFO made hundreds of thousands of dollars, but he had four kids that were going to school in, in succession. And so he was still going to qualify for a couple tens of thousands on each kid because they were all going to really expensive schools. Because if you have an expected contribution of 110 grand, but you have three kids in school, that 110 divides three ways. And now all of a sudden it's a little more than, it's like 33,000 per. Mm -hmm. Now you qualify for financial aid, even if you make several hundred thousand dollars. So people really have to do their research to figure out where it would be, where they don't get any aid. And it's a lot higher than most people think. In terms of the mistakes people make, the biggest one is people put their retirement account or their home value as an asset available to pay for college. Mm -hmm. On the financial aid application, specifically the, the federal one, the FAFSA, that one specifically says your retirement and your home don't count. But I know high school counselors that have put the value of their home down, not their equity, the value. <laughs> so it's a very common mistake. And you know, if your home is worth 200 grand, you just cost yourself 10 grand in financial aid. Mm -hmm. So it's really easy to make a mistake with one account that you have thinking, oh, well, they asked about my, my mutual funds or my stocks, or my savings. It's like, yes, but not the ones in your retirement account. So leave those out of it. And those two mistakes alone cost people tens of thousands of dollars per year times multiple years. Is there a third mistake people make? <laughs> hmm. The third mistake probably has more to do with education choice. I see a lot of students who get hung up on really wanting to go to one school because it's their dream school or their family went there and they're just dead set on it. Um, but when you do that, especially the Harvard's like, and the Princeton's, huh? those ones, even schools like USC schools like that, uh, Boston I college. <laughs> and these, and these are not bad schools. And most of the time they do want to help you, but I know of students who have applied to those schools as either early decision or the only one they applied to. And now you lose all your leverage financially to go to those schools, because if you have other schools that have accepted you, you can now say, well, this school is giving me more money. I would like to come to your school, but there's other, there's other options here. And it was something, uh, the Higher Education Research Institute out of UCLA does a study every year about incoming freshmen. 
And there's, I think it's like 30 to 40% last time I looked, which was a couple of years ago, of students choose their second choice school because of finances. So you're giving up, a large number of students are giving up that ability to have a little more choice and save some money in education because they get too hung up on the one school. And sometimes that school isn't even right for them anyway, because they like the school. It doesn't even have their program or their boyfriend or their girlfriend. It was right for them, but it wasn't right for the, that the individual who's going. So, you know, choosing the right school for the right reasons and not getting hung up just because it's a school, you know, that's, that's a really big mistake. I see students make every year. So is, is COVID still affecting, you know, colleges and where you're taking your classes and living on campus, et cetera? That's a great question. So I have seen a lot of different articles coming out in the past few months with varying answers on that. So in some cases, COVID is actually driving students away from schools because these students don't want to have to deal with a lot of the mandates. You have a lot of these teenagers that may have already gotten COVID, had very little symptoms, and now they're being told they need to stick a needle in their arm. And regardless of whether someone believes that's a necessity or not, that's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about the student's position is, I've already had it. I don't want to stick a needle in my arm just to go to school. I'll go someplace else or I study online. So you do have a lot of schools that have actually started making those mandates optional or getting rid of them entirely because they have seen it start to hit their bottom line. Is it up to the schools schools? or is it up to their states? In most cases, up to the schools because- Now, there are some places in certain states and certain cities where those mandates have been in effect, where those schools are just complying with local mandates. And you've other seen other places where schools are saying, we can't afford to abide by the mandate because our students won't come and pay us. So there's, there's so many conflicts between students that won't come unless they're vaccinated. But I know a lot of families who are like, I won't send my kid if they're going to make them get a needle. So there's a lot of discrepancy there, and it's, it's not a small percentage of the population, and that's going to majorly affect the bottom lines of these schools that will affect this choice in the future. So let's talk about uh, the last thing, which is upcoming changes to college costs. Where's the future taking us? Oh, the future taking us, um, and I will do my best because some people will take it as a political angle, and this really is not meant to be a political <laughs> angle at all. Um, Everything's so political the, these days. Yeah. So the current Department of Education uh, is making some changes to the financial aid system that will take place in two years. So they're not putting it in now. They're letting it sit for two years, and then it will take effect. The biggest one to families is they are getting rid of the division of cost for multiple students. So before I had mentioned that if your family contribution is, say, thirty or 40000 which is about what it would be if you make anywhere between one hundred and twenty to one hundred and seventy thousand dollars, depending on other circumstances. That's kind of a, a, a broad range. So in that situation, your contribution is thirty to forty thousand. You have two kids going to school, so now that thirty to forty thousand is now fifteen to twenty per kid because the system says, well, you're one family, you're one parent, you can only afford to pay X amount for school. So if you have two kids going to school. Logic would dictate you have to divide that between your students. The current Department of of Education, along with a few of the senators who are on the board, basically says, well, a family with multiple students shouldn't get a discount. So they are getting rid of that deduction in two years. So if your cost before was $30,000 for one student and $15,000 per student, pretty soon it's going to be $30,000 per kid. So that's going to be absolutely devastating to, you know, the uh, lower and middle class families, any family that is at the, at the very disadvantaged side of the scale. So if you make, you know, $40,000, $50,000 and less, it's probably not going to affect you that much because it's already pretty inexpensive to begin with. It's probably not going to matter all that much. And a, a student could actually work and pay for those, some of those costs. But for any of those middle class families making, you know, upper upper five digits, you know, getting up into the hundreds, the two hundreds, it's going to drastically affect your cost, adding tens of thousands of dollars to college costs each year. That's a that's a major hammer. Um, there's a few other ones they're getting rid of, but that's the the biggest one that's coming up that families really need to you know you know call their their congressperson, their senator, and say, hey, this isn't right. Because that's, that's going to be a, a massive blow to the middle-class families trying to get higher education. 
Well, I think we've covered about everything. I can't believe how fast our time has gone today. Oh, yeah. Thanks so much for filling us in. Um, how can listeners reach you if they have more questions? I assume you can help them and reach out to them. Sure. There's a contact page on my website, collegeboundstrategies.com. Uh, my uh, email for the book is justin at collegeboundstrategies.com. People are willing to, are, willing, uh, are welcome to share emails with me there. Uh, the book can be found, College Bound Strategies can be found at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, lulu.com, any other place books are sold online. Uh, and there's even a Facebook page uh, where we talk about some of the upcoming things. We post other interviews that have come up. So uh, those are all the places that people are welcome to reach out to me. Now, things keep changing so quickly. How often do you update your book? <laughs> so the book was last published and last updated as of the spring of 2020. I will be updating it again for the spring of 2022. So I, I do right. it roughly about every two years. Um, the system for financial aid itself hasn't changed all that much in 50, 60 years. There have been slow incremental changes to mm -hmm. say how much you can save without it counting against you. Uh, differences on, on uh, uh, different allowances for state taxes and things like that. By the way, right. state tax is another one going away. So if you live in a high tax state, that discount's going away for you too. That's going to further increase your price. Wow. So uh, these things have slowly been changing over time, but with the big changes that are coming up in two years, those are things that while they aren't established changes for next year, they do need to be brought up so families can plan on them. Because if you you know have a freshman going in right now, your first two years may look great. Then two years later, it's a time bomb that went off and all of a sudden your cost increased a lot. So, you know, those are things I'll have to mention. We'll kind of see how the law plays out. Well, I wish they'd figure out how to reduce the uh, pay that a lot of administrators are getting because that's taking the price of, of uh, education so much higher than the cost of uh, inflation. Mm -hmm. So hopefully they can figure that out. Yeah. Anyway, oh, and one, one more thing before we go. Yeah. Um, I also proposed a law called the STAR Act. And this law basically took some of these highly unfair things that you know myself and my partner had taken a look at, as well as a few congressmen and senators we talked to. And right now it's being proposed by Debbie Lesko out of Arizona. And I think Rand Paul was also the senator who was on it. Uh, we had talked to those folks about getting this on. And basically the STAR Act is the start of a series of legal proposals that'll change the law around education. So that way the Department of Education can't randomly change things anymore. Yeah. And it will basically codify certain things that can give families more predictability without you know, any um, government organizations being able to change them on a whim. Yeah. Good thing you moved to Arizona. I don't see anything like that happening in California. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's always hope. <laughs> yes. Hope. Hopium. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again for coming on the show. And again, a reminder, all our live shows become recorded podcasts, video casts uh, on all our platforms mentioned before and like YouTube, blog, talk, radio, Podbean, etc. cetera. And uh, please click the like button below or whatever platform you happen to be watching on because it helps reach even more people with the algorithms, etc. And all my listeners, thank you again for tuning in each and every week. So until next week, thank you again. And may God richly bless you. Bye-bye. Our featured speaker is a best-selling author who has written numerous books and articles. He's a speaker, life coach, and host of Dave, the Caregiver's Caregiver radio program. He frequently appears on television and radio shows all across the country and has even shared the stage with Suzanne Summers at Harvard. But his most important role is caregiver to his beautiful wife, Charlene, for over 22 years. Please welcome Mr. Dave Nassani. I want to share with you a love story. In a couple of weeks, my wife and I will be celebrating 44 years of being together. My wife, Charlene, and I had a fairy tale, storybook, romance, courtship, and marriage for the first 21 years of our lives together. One day out of nowhere, my wife has a headache, the headache of her life. She suffered a massive stroke and it left her severely speech impaired and paralyzed on the right side. And in that moment, our world turned upside down. I gotta tell you, the next two years was like a living hell. I just didn't know what to do. I felt guilty most of the time. I became a caregiver. I didn't even know what a caregiver was. I was experiencing the same problems that other caregivers experienced. If you don't take care of you, I can't take care of her. Well, that's why I wrote the book. Now I can teach other caregivers. I'm living proof that you can thrive as a caregiver. My wife and I travel now 
all over the world sharing our story. One day, life is going to call upon you to be the captain of your boat. Heck, you might be saving your own life. Thank you. Sometimes it feels like the sun will never rise, like the birds will never sing again. Keep breathing, take it in. Like the birds will never sing